Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm from Team Data Wills 13,000, and I'm here to present to you a video of six new rule changes from the game manual of the 2019-2020 FTC season. We will be playing clips from the first kickoff and going over the rule changes in this video. After reading the game manual, we picked these six new rule changes because we thought they're important. There may be more, and if you would like one mentioned, please leave a comment below. Let's get into the rules. Minimum robot weight information can be found in game manual 1, section RG04. This rule was brought back from last year, and, it's, and the rule remains the same with 42 pounds including the battery but not including the alliance flags or markers. We think it's important because of past inspection and our guess is that it will stay as a permanent rule going forward. Alliance marker information can be found in Game Manual 1, Section RG06. In the last years, teams used alliance flags that would often be easily broken. The new alliance markers are team supplied. For Red Alliance, it is a solid square measuring 2.5 inches length and width. The blue lines marker must be a solid blue circle approximately 2.5 inches in diameter. Both alliance markers must be removable. The alliance markers must be strong enough to withstand match. This rule is to allow easy identification of robots and their alliance to field personnel and are easier and stronger than the flag. If you don't want to make your own alliance markers, there is a set available on Annie Mark's website. Here's an example of the alliance marker set that they offer. I know that with some drivers, alliance markers must be really strong. Drivers, alliance markers must be really strong. Challenge. What exactly is the purpose of a human player? The hum Thank you. Thank you. I did not cover that. So the human player has a couple of different purposes in this game. One, you'll notice the human player station for the Red Alliance, which is located over there, the human player station is here. One of the purposes of that is so that robots that are building in the red zone need to come across, so that it creates a little bit of traffic. The human player also is the source for stones being entered onto the field after the autonomous period. During autonomous, the only stones that are in play are the 12 that you see here. And for each alliance, it's really only six because they're only able to access the six that are on their side, two sky stones and four stones. After the end of autonomous period, just like other autonomous periods end, the scores are calculated, and now the teams pick up their remote controls and start driver control. At that point, the human player can start to enter stones into the playing field. The, stone, the rules for the entry of the stones are there cannot be another stone already in the depot, and there cannot be a robot in the depot. We don't want the human player to be feeding the robot directly. So the human player will be able to drop the sky stone in, or stone I should say in, and then the robot will come and pick it up. Number four, calculating ranking and tiebreaker points. Game manual one, rule 4.8.1. Change from last year, average ranking points and average tiebreaking points. At the end of each match, ranking points and tiebreaker points are awarded. Average ranking points are calculated by adding the ranking points, two for a win, one for a tie, and zero for a loss or disqualification, and then dividing by the total number of matches played. We don't think there's a big change to this rule. Average tiebreaker points are calculated by adding the tiebreaker points from each match then subtracting the lowest scoring match, and then dividing by the total number of matches played minus the dropped match. In this example, the team competes in five matches. The first match had the lowest amount of tiebreaker points, and therefore, those points, the 15, will be dropped from the average tiebreaker point calculation. We believe this will push up the, the average tiebreaker points, making it more com competitive, and we believe this will help some of the lower point scoring teams remain competitive in the competitions longer. Got a few more here. What do you got? Uh, is there a limit to the number of sky or just stones you can control in general at any given moment?
Yes, one. One sky stone can be controlled at a time per robot. And that includes obviously holding it and moving it, but also kind of corralling it. If you're pushing a bunch of sky stones together, that's considered control. Read the game manual for more specifics on that, but uh, one is the answer at the high level. At the start of the match, the stones that are available for teams to access include the six stones on each side. So each alliance gets access to the six stones, meaning that the blue alliance can't go over to the red alliance's side and access their stones. Of the stones that are lined here, they will be aligned in a random fashion, such that you don't know where the sky stone, which are the stones that are identified by the vision target, are located. And they're going to be arranged after the robots are put on the field by the teams. Ooh. The purpose of the sky stone is so that teams will be able to use, again, either Euphoria or TensorFlow to identify the unique attributes of the sky stone based on the vision target. If they access those stones, sky stones, and bring them under their alliance sky bridge as the first or second stone, each of those is worth 10 points by identifying those and bringing them under first. If they don't, and they pick up a standard stone, those options are not open anymore to them. Once the standard stone goes under, it's worth two points instead of 10 to go under the sky bridge, but that also means that the sky stone bonuses are no longer available. So they have to get this them too. Now, one question that I would have just off hearing that, how tall does it count as a skyscraper? How many blocks tall? A skyscraper can be as small as one level tall. Now, you get points for delivering the stone or the sky stones across under the sky bridge. You get points for placing the sky stone on the foundation. That is a placed sky stone. You will get points for the placement, but that is not a level because the sky stone or the stone isn't interlocked with the foundation. So this is zero level, but you get points for placing the sky stone or stone. This is a level one stone, which also gets points for being placed. This is a level two stone because it's interlocking with the stone below it. The end game. You can imagine your robot, your team has built a beautiful skyscraper. Just gorgeous. If you want to get another 15 points, you need to move that foundation with the skyscrapers on it out of the building site. This is the building site. This half is the building zone. That's going to lead to some really interesting situations and a lot of white knuckles, I think, on the controllers. Thank you. That actually works perfectly because the question from chat, Jules is panicking, asks, do you lose points if you knock over your team's skyscraper? Do you lose points if you don't cap your skyscraper? If you knock over your team's skyscraper. Because yes. I know it's it noted that if you knock over your opposing team's skyscraper, you You cannot do that. Points. But yes, if you, you in points. the process of building your skyscrapers or moving your foundation, knock over those towers, those skyscrapers, you're they don't in trouble. count anymore as points? Yep. Hmm. So they'll count as points if they are still laying, if they like I said, if you um, Deliver is bringing it under the sky bridge. Placing it is putting it on the foundation. Levels only count as the stones interlock with each other. So this is still worth points, but not as many as if it were stacked up because you still get the points for placing, but you also then get the points for the levels that you reach. Those are our six rules changes. Please leave us feedback and suggestions in the comments below and, sub and subscribe to DataWolves for more.